Okay, here, uh, welcome to part two of this free body diagram video. We're going to continue on with the, um, um, the second half of this lesson. So uh, where we left off was we had written down all the equations that we could think of for this free body diagram of our spring-loaded tray. And uh, now we're, we're coming down here and we're looking at um, what, uh, what do we want to solve for. So R sub S, or the, the spring reaction force, is the value that we want to solve for. So let's look, look at our, <coughs> our known values and then look at our unknown variables. And that will help us understand what we have to work with and um, what equations are, are most useful for us to use in, in solving this problem. So um, our, our F sub L or FL is our lift force. Uh, we're saying that that's uh, a given, is two pounds. And we know that um, uh, the weight of the tray is a pound and a half. And uh, I'm not sure if that was mentioned earlier, but we're just going to say that that's uh, a known value as well. That's uh, a value that's given to us in this problem. Uh, we know that our <clears throat> our angle is 30 degrees. We know distance 1 is 2 inches, distance 2 is 5 inches, and distance 3 is 10 inches. Now our unknown variables are uh, the, the reaction force at uh, the pivot point in the y direction, and the reaction force at the pivot point in the x direction, and then finally uh, our reaction force of the spring, which can be broken down into uh, reaction force of the spring in the y direction and reaction force of the spring in the x direction. So, uh, <clears throat> looking at our list of equations, and given that uh, Rs is what we want to solve for, the reaction force of the spring on the tray, <clears throat> which, which, uh, which equations can we use to solve for Rs? RS. So I'm going to look at the diagram. And okay, it's the diagonal over there. But it's broken down into two components. So I'm just scanning the equations looking for RS. Uh, equation number three the Pythagorean theorem there. Okay. It goes RS squared and Mm -hmm. Then we're going to do a square root, and then we'll find out. All right, so in order to solve equation number three, what uh, what values do we need? RS, RS x squared, RS y squared. Okay, do we have either of those two? No. The only thing we do have is the d, as in dog, the length, mm -hmm. fl, we have G. We have the uh, everything in our known values, right? That's yeah, that's yeah. the information we have. And degrees. Um, but we could find RSX and RSY if we know the angle, which is 30 degrees. So, yeah, let's see. But it looks like you picked equation 5 here. I did, yeah. Uh, equation three, we we don't know any of those. There are three variables or three, um, yeah, three variables in equation three, and we don't know any of them, right? Rsx, Rsy, and Rs. We don't have any of that information. So I look at that and think we can't. That equation is not useful to us right now because we don't have any of those values. So I look for an equation where we do have enough of the values that we can solve for, you know, the the last variable. Um, so equation one, RPY, we don't know what that is. FL, we know what that is. RSY, we don't know what that is. And G, which is just the, the force due to gravity um, or, or the weight of the tray, that uh, we do have that. So for equation one, we have two of the variables, but we don't have the other two. And to be able to solve an equation, we, we have to be left with just a single unknown variable, right? Okay. So I say equation one, we can't use that. <clears throat> equation two, RPX, RSX, do we have either of those? No. Nope. So we can't use that one. Equation three, we've already talked about. Equation four, 
R is X, R is Y, and theta. Do we have any of those values? No. We have theta, but we don't have R is X or R is Y. So we have two unknown variables, which means we can't solve that one. So then we go to equation 5. <clears throat> now, in equation 5, which, which variables do we have values for? Uh, D2 and D3, FL, G, D1, and RSY is the unknown. Right, so, so equation so 5, we just have one unknown variable. Yeah, so here we have simplified equation 5, so we set it up, so the unknown is on the left, and then we can just plug in the numbers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's going on underneath? We want to equation 7. Uh, yep, I also have equation 7. Before we get there, let's, let's finish going through our list here. So equation 5 we've determined is one that we can use. We can solve for that. Uh, equation 6, uh, Rsx, Rs, and cosine theta. <coughs> we don't have uh, Rsx or, or Rs yet, right? Yeah. And then equation 7, Rsy and Rs and sine theta. We have theta, but we don't know Rsy or Rs yet. Right. So for starters, the only equation we can use right now before we've solved anything else is equation number five. I'm thinking in my mind, what if problems become more complex than this? Is this the best approach to solving a free body diagram problem? Because listing all the equations, things get really complicated if you're listing all the equations or this is the process that you always take. Yeah, if, if you have... Um, something that's really, really complex, then there might be an unwieldy uh, number of equations. Um, but if you're solving really complex free body diagrams, then that probably indicates that you're, you're pretty familiar with them already, and you might be able to cut out the step of writing down all the equations because you kind of know what to look for at that point. Um, but really, Free body diagrams typically don't get too crazy in terms of all the different like variables and forces and distances associated with them. Usually you want to break something down to manageable chunks. So something like what we have here is what I would call a manageable chunk. And uh, if, if there's more going on than that, then <clears throat> how do I say this? You want to break your, your system down so that you don't have a uh, hundred different variables. Uh, more often than not, you're not going to be solving free body diagrams that have much more than what you see right here. So whenever you have a client and they want something built, this is usually a step you take? You list out all the equations like this? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. to figure out how you're going to solve the, the unknown. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Equation number five and number seven. Yeah. Well, so equation number five was the only one that we can solve right off the bat. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. So then we solve for equation number five, and that gives us R is Y. And once we have R is Y, then we can solve for R S. And we did the same thing. We put the unknown on the left. Mm hmm That's right. R S. Yep. Um, are we going to plug in the numbers or? Well, we can, but I've I've kind of plugged in the numbers in the background, and if you solve the equation, it yields a, a spring force or RS of twelve and a half pounds. So, what what does that twelve and a half pounds mean? So, RS we now know equals twelve and a half pounds. What does that mean? I'm not gonna read the text. So <laughs> I, I looked away. Uh, what does it mean? Mm. Spring force. So if I put two pounds of force as FL, then RS will have 12.5 pounds of force. It'll fight back with 12.5, basically pushing the other direction. Almost. I, I, would, I wouldn't look at it as if you put two pounds of force, then RS is going to fight back with Twelve and a half pounds, because RS that's a spring constant. That that's a value that the spring always has, regardless of 
how much force we apply at the end. So regardless of how much force we apply at the end of the tray, the spring is always going to be pushing or pulling with 12 and a half pounds of force because you know that's that's how the spring was designed to to pull with that much force and that's that's just a fixed value. So that means that we have to push or pull FL needs to be 14.5 for it to move. Nope, nope. Um, so that two pounds of FL that's already baked into all of our equations, right? That's a value that we use to solve um, for for RS, and this is in equilibrium. So <clears throat> we're assuming that some of the forces equal zero, and some of the moments equal zero. That's where we derived all of our equations. Put those two assumptions. So I guess we need to get a spring that's has twelve point five strength. Is that what you call it? Twelve point, yeah. That uh, exerts twelve and a half pounds of force, but no more. Is that right? <clears throat> so, considering that we're solving for a state of equilibrium, that is a state in which nothing will move. <clears throat> what what twelve and a half pounds tells us is that when we put two pounds of force at FL. We're, we are going to be exactly counteracting that 12 and a half pounds spring force. We're at equilibrium. We're, we're exactly counteracting that spring force. So we put up, we put two pounds of force and, you know, theoretically nothing at all happens. But what happens when we put 2.001 pounds of force at FL? I don't know, you, you, you lost me kind of with the equilibrium word. Okay. Uh, I, this is not something that they use often in Khan Academy, so I, I don't even know what that means, where it's coming from. Uh, in, in this context, equilibrium just means that the system is at rest. Nothing is moving. But the table is moving because I'm pulling it up with two pounds of force. Okay, so that's, that's, that is the crux of what we're talking about right now. Will the table move up with two pounds of force? And the answer is no, it won't. Two pounds of force will exactly balance out the 12 and a half pound force of the spring. And, and we know that's the case because the equations we use to solve for this are assuming that's the case because we're saying some of the forces equal zero and some of the moments equal zero. I'm not understanding what the 2.5 means. Or how I should use it to to solve this. Uh, Let's see. Maybe we can watch the video. Uh, I did do a video, didn't I? Yeah. Here it is. This video. Okay. I'm gonna screenshot this and we'll draw a little bit. Okay, so here's the spring right there, right? Okay. And the spring is pulling the tray in this direction, right? With 12.5 pounds of force. With 12.5 pounds of force, exactly. 0.5 pounds of force. When I apply 2 pounds of pressure under the table. Nope. <clears throat> Before you've applied and even after you apply any force over here, this spring is always going to be pulling with 12 and a half pounds of force. I thought that determining on how long the spring is, if it's contracted or not, it'll, it'll affect how much force it's pulling with. It does. You're right. We're okay. kind of simplifying this. Okay. Yeah. We're just assuming it's a constant force with 12.5 pounds. Okay. So, <clears throat> What we have determined is that when when a user uh, pulls with with um, two pounds of force up here, that that is the point at which equilibrium is achieved, or in other words, the point at which if you were to apply just a hair more force, the tray would would start to move. And and really, maybe <clears throat> maybe a better way to say this is that we, we wanted to know what spring force 
would be required to, to hold the tray down or to prevent the tray from being lifted up when a two pound force was applied at the end of the tray. So that's what we were trying to solve for. How much spring force is required to prevent the tray from being lifted up when you apply two pounds of force pushing the tray up at the end? <clears throat> and that's how we came up with this 12 and a half pound value. Can we go back to the equations that we use? Equation number five and number seven? Sure. I want to see... Here I want to see if we use two pounds in the equation. Okay. Okay, so equation number five does have D3 FL mm -hmm. as the moment. Right. And number seven doesn't need it because we're already using number five. Right. I'm thinking, what does equation number five mean? I need to refresh my mind. D1 sure. R supply. <clears throat> D1 RSY plus D2G. And also, D2G is the moment for G. D3FL is the moment for FL. D1 RSY. Okay, that's the moment for RSY. What does equation number five mean, though, I'm thinking? Equation number five is the sum of the moments. <clears throat> so when you're solving three-bided diagrams, you can, you can sum the moments, you can sum the forces. Those are really the two key types of equations, sum of the moments and sum of the forces. And the plus and the negative signs in equation number five are determined if the forces are going clockwise or counterclockwise. That's right. Mm, relative so, to <clears throat> relative to our pivot point, right? Our, our, our axis. And <clears throat> what would help make sense to me was would be to go over equation number five in the meaning of what D one R S Y actually means. Okay. Okay. So we're taking our, um, our, our pivot point as R sub P, right? The pivot reaction force, which is the yellow dot. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and we're saying uh, we're going to create an equation that defines the sum of the moments. So the, the first moment we have is D1 RSY. So D1 is the distance to the blue dot and the blue dot represents the reaction force of the spring on the tray, right? Yep, I understand. So that's, that's moment one. <clears throat> and is that a clockwise or a counterclockwise moment? No, it's clockwise. I do understand up to this point, yeah. Uh, but I don't understand what D1 RSY actually means. Like, I know it's a moment, but what does it mean in plain English? When we find the answer, see 12.5, RSY, D1 RSY is 12.5. 12.5, I, I no, actually that's RSY, not D1 RSY. That's different. Because D1 RSY is the, the moment. D1 RSY is the moment, yeah. <clears throat> so maybe another way to think about it is if the only moment acting on this tray was D1 RSY, what would happen to the tray? What happened to okay? There's the D1 right here. I was I was looking at D1 RSY as one variable together, but it's not. Uh, it's two things. Right. So multiply. Two values. Two values. So we isolate RSY. And now I'm trying to think. RSY. Going down is a vector. It's the Y vector of RS. Hmm. 
I'm trying to understand like what if I'm doing this on my own, I will get lost here uh, <clears throat> with, with these moments. Like, what what is the moment telling me that there's a force going down in a particular place, uh, distance from an axis? You might be overthinking it. Mm, maybe, but if I come to the answer with 12.5, mm-hmm. I would definitely be like, what does that even mean? Like 12.5, where did that come from? I'm just plugging in numbers, but really not understanding what the answer is telling me. I can do these equations fine on my own. I can find the equations, I can plug in the numbers, but when I get to that 12.5, I'm not sure what I'm doing with that number. Subtracting, it, what it means, that's when I'm lost. So that's why I'm, right now I'm trying to take a step back and see where that number came from. To see if I can understand. This is not easy stuff. And <clears throat> there are certainly going to be times when you just kind of have to let your brain think on it for a while before it starts making sense. There are going to be a lot of times where you're not going to get something immediately. And it's going to take a little while for uh-huh. it to just simmer in your head before it makes sense. So, thus... <clears throat> RS is 12.5 pounds. Mm-hmm. Mm. Force. So does that mean that if when I'm pulling with two pounds of force here, this fights back with 12.5 mm-hmm. or after. <clears throat> what this tells us is that up to two pounds of force, lifting force, this tray is not going to move. Up to two pounds of lifting force, this tray is not going to move. And how, how do you know that? Because we used... Um, is it this right here? Yeah, some of the moments equal zero and some of the forces equal zero. The fact that the sums equal zero is very significant. That when we say the sum of the moments equal zero and the sum of the forces equal zero, that infers that there is equilibrium. In other words, there is no motion. So we th- we know that there's no tray motion when up to two pounds of lift force is applied because we assumed no motion in our equations. We said equals zero. Is two pounds of force this number here? Is that the moment? Just FL. Two yeah. pounds of force is oh, just, FL. Just FL? Yeah. Um, So what is the value for this moment? Then we just <clears throat> excuse me. We just have to multiply two times d three. Mm-hmm. And how much is d three? Um, well, let me see. <clears throat> Look at my computer. So, <clears throat> D3 is 10, and 10 what, 10 inches? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 10 inches times 2 pounds of force. And D2G, D2 is... Five inches. G is, but we don't want to use nine point eight because that's metric. Um, what was the translation to gravity in inches? Or? No, we're just saying that G is the force or the weight of the tray, and that was defined as a one point five pounds. Okay, one point five pounds of force. And then D one R 
does have it. The one is two inches. In RSY, we found it was 12.5. That's what we solved for, right? Yeah, we're just plugging it in now. Back to the old equation. Um, so if we happen to have this equation now, it all equals zero. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> should I add to the other side or should I just leave it how it is? I don't know. What are you trying to do? Um, I'm trying to put the sentence that you said that at equilibrium, when two pounds of force is here, then there will be 12 and a half pounds of force as RS on the string. And I'm trying to look at the equation and understand um, how it reflects that. And it reflects that because it all equals zero. So, but actually I'm trying to translate that into the moments, like the force of the moments. So two times 12 and a half, that's 24, 25 um, inches times pounds force. What does that translate to? Inches like that? Is that the equation? Yeah, inch pounds. Inch pounds. Okay. So that's, um, inch pounds force, technically, but usually okay. people just say inch, inch pounds. pounds. <clears throat> And that's um, three inch pounds force minus twenty inch pounds force equals zero. So twenty five plus three, twenty eight minus twenty equals eight. Let's see, let's check your math there. <clears throat> so we've got D1 times RSY. Wait, hold on, that's 5 times 1.5. Which is 7.5. Alright, let's write this out a little bit more cleanly. Okay, so D1... R S Y plus D two G oh, minus D three F L equals zero, right? <clears throat> and D one is what? D one is two inches. Okay. And R S Y twelve point five pounds. Twelve point five pounds. D two that's five inches. Okay. G, the 1.5, 1.5, minus D3, 10 inches, inches. times FL, uh, which is 2 pounds, equals 0. Okay, so 2 times 12.5 is 25, plus 7.5, minus 20, equals 0. That does not work out, does it? That's... 32.5 minus 20 equals 0, which is not true. <clears throat> so why is that? <clears throat> oh, because RSY is not 12.5. RS is 12.5. Mm, okay. Um, well, what's, what's RSY then? Because here we, we solve it, but... <clears throat> You only gave us the 12.5, which is the end of this one. Mm -hmm. So down here, um, where I've circled in red, you'll see that what I've done is take equation 7 and solve for <coughs> RS. And that's what I have. Um, you know, RS equals RSY over sine theta. That's just a reconfigured form of equation 7. You see that? Yeah. What's the value for RSY, though? Let's, let's find out. I, I never directly solved for RSY. We 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 took the val RSY equals D three F L minus D two G divided oh. by D one and we substituted that into this equation number seven. 
Okay. So we never directly solve for RSY. Of course, now that we know RS is 12 and a half, we, we can go back and solve for RSY. So let's do that. So RS sine theta equals RSY, right? R S Y equals R S sine theta. And now we know that R S is 12.5 times sine of theta, well, sine of 30. So let's see what that is. Sine of theta times 12.5 equals 6.25. So R S Y equals 6.25. And now we come back up here and just uh, delete all this stuff. Oops. Oh, come on. Okay, so D1, what is D1 again? Uh, two inches. Two inches. So two times 6.25. Plus D2? 5 inches. 5 inches times 1.5 minus 10 inches times 2 equals 0. So now we have, <clears throat> what is this? 12.5 uh, plus 7.5 minus 20 equals 0. Adding these two numbers, we get 20 minus 20 equals 0. So uh, now, I, now I understand. Okay. Yeah, when we plug it back in, yeah, I see. I think this is uh, what happens. Like sometimes you, you may see this problem so so many times that you're an expert that you already get to it. But for me, it was the first time I see this. So now it's, it's clicking. We have to take a couple steps back and plug numbers back into older equations. Good. That's valuable. So it it it, it makes sense now what we're doing. Yeah. Now I see that the moments. Uh, our equilibrium, there's no motion going clockwise or counterclockwise, which the motion going left would be counterclockwise, would be lifting the tray. Mm -hmm. um, that, that motion is not happening now. So at these moments, the, 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 the moments have to be these forces for there to be an equilibrium. And now I see where the 12.5 is. Therefore, what do we need to do next? to design this table or this spring, right? And that's the question that we're looking at now, right? So what does this value mean, 12.5? Exactly. So if the user puts two pounds of force, is this right? Let's go ahead and erase. Yeah. Do one of like those top, that squiggly. Life. Yeah. So if the user puts in <clears throat> two pounds of force here, it really translates to a moment with this value, mm -hmm. but that will lead to no motion. Right. That does have to connect it. See? Right. That's exactly right. And what do we need to do? Well, as far as what's in the lesson, we don't need to do anything further. But if we wanted to take it a step further in the real world, so now we know that a spring that produces 12 and a half pounds of force will um, allow the tray to stay down when up to two pounds of force is used to lift it. All right, now. Okay. So if this, if we have a spring that creates this amount of force and that leads to this moment, which ultimately leads to no motion, therefore we need to subtract subtract two pounds as uh, some line. So this is 18 right here, right? Yeah. What if we subtracted um, just one pound from that 12 and a half spring force? Well, actually, uh, D1 is the distance, R is Y. What if we try, I don't even know. Like, do we subtract it from here or from here? First off, let's define what we're doing. I'm pretty sure I know where you're going. I think where you're going is, what do we have to change here 
in order for two pounds of force to actually lift the tray up. Is that right? Exactly, because okay. two pounds is gonna stay constant. Mm -hmm. That was our goal. Right. Two pounds. Right. So what else do we need to change? What do we need to change to produce uh, motion to, to li actually lift the tray? And the easiest thing would be, I mean, the tray is already solid. The cheapest thing would be a spring. This spring is too strong, right? Okay. So let's get a weaker spring. But how much weaker is the question. Mm, good question. That's how much true. indeed. And really we're focusing on, not this one. We're just focusing on, on this. Okay. And I'm trying to find out the two is the distance, so the two is going to stay. So really all we can change is this, right? Okay, and where did that come from? That's RSY, right? RSY, <clears throat> as you guys are watching at home, you can pull up, uh, open another tab and go, go to the lesson. RSY is, I'm looking at the diagram. Yeah, like the name indicates, there's a spring R S R S Y R S X R S Y is the the vertical uh, force component component. Thank you. The vertical component of R S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you directly change R S Y? R S Y cannot be directly changed because you have to change RS. Exactly. Yep. And that's the spring. Mm -hmm. But how much? Then? Huh? You tell me, how much? Uh, I know at the end of the day, we have to at least reduce it by two pounds. Why? Two pounds force. So that this number ends up being 18. Why? Because 18 minus 20, wait. Yeah, we want to go in the negative direction because it's counterclockwise in the tray. Okay. Wait, hold on, hold on. It's not that we're going actually up. Wait. This is counterclockwise. Sorry, right. I messed up. I'm thinking about a clock. The clock goes this way. So counterclockwise, and we determined this was negative. So we need this at the equal sign. At the end of the equal sign, we need that to be a negative 2. I agree with part of that statement. <laughs> <laughs> what did I miss here? <clears throat> the, the end of the equal sign needs to be negative. But why does it need to be negative too? Actually, it doesn't need to be negative too. It just needs to be negative. It could be negative 0 0.01. Exactly. Yeah. You get that. Would this mean that it's moving really slow up? Like it's going to be a lot of friction. Maybe. But we're not going to get that complicated, Yeah, right? we're not getting into that. <laughs> so, what do we need to do so that this ends up at least being... Just add... Actually... That 12... That 6.25... So, RSY. why... I'm lost. Where, where do I go from here? Uh, I, I think you did it. I mean, that's it. You want the... The right side of that equation <coughs> to be negative. I want to buy a spring, mm -hmm. and I need to get a spring that's that's the units um, twelve point five was RS, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And that is the vector. So does your spring force. force need to be more or less than 12 and a half pounds? See, that's, that's what I was getting at. I'm thinking about that. Okay. And if it's more, that number will increase. The 20 will become 21, 22, etc. Mm -hmm. So I need to buy a spring. This is the answer. I need to buy a spring <laughs> that's less force than 12.5. Boom. Trumpet sounding. Lights going <laughs> off. Confetti everywhere. That's we it. did it. We did it. We passed the final. <laughs> okay. If you found this content helpful, consider enrolling in our signature program at mypipelineacademy.com. Whether you're an individual interested in beginning a new career as a mechanical designer 
or a company interested in training your new engineering hires. Our signature program helps students develop the practical skills they need to be productive mechanical design engineers. Seating is limited. We hope to see you there soon.